Okay, so um, the uh, my name's Adam Timlett. For anybody who doesn't know, I think you all know me. Um, and I'm giving uh, this talk about agility and um, where I've got to with my research into agility. And really, the, the, the kind of the research that I've been doing has involved quite a few different avenues and paths, including simulating um, software projects and things like that. Um, and I've given various talks and written things so far, but this is kind of more the distillation of um, what I see now is the kind of the best takeaways from the research that I've done. Um, and it's all about trying to turn agility more into a science. And so I've had to come to kind of some conclusion about what science is it's connected to. And, and I've decided it's to do with decision making and it's to do with learning. And so I've now kind of given this talk with a title uh, to attract you with the idea that, that there is a kind of a science of decision making while learning. And so that's that's what the talk is, go is going to be about, so how to how to make decisions while learning and conversely, how to learn while making decisions. And and hopefully um, you'll see why I think that that is a kind of a good description of agility, but also maybe changes the way you think about agility. Um, and makes it kind of more more precise, maybe in terms of what we mean. Um, and there can be good and bad agility, and maybe this could help to decide which 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 is it, which is which. So the uh, kind of agenda for for the talk is that first I'm going to show you how we make decisions more formally, and um, and I'm going to uh, define the the. Uh, the, the idea of making decisions while learning in a scientific way. Um, I should also say, I forgot to mention that my friend James White is, is uh, uh, his artwork is kind of peppers this, this talk. And um, hopefully you'll see there is a connection to that, uh, uh, to the artwork in, in the talk too. Um, James's work is about kind of science too. So his art is about science. So this idea of, of making decisions while learning, um, you know, it, it's it it also relates to to art, even though I'm talking about um, learning in a more scientific way. Um, so uh, I'm going to, after defining the idea of what making decisions while learning means, I'm going to show you how to factor that in to your decision making. And so hopefully, both in a kind of more heavyweight decisions where we're used to kind of making decisions more, you know, scientifically because they're bigger decisions. Um, we're also going to think about it intuitively so that actually you can think about this just kind of in an everyday context, because it does come up all, all the time, these kinds of problems. Um, and then finally, I'm going to talk about how uh, even more complex decisions which have many different kind of dimensions and, and aspects to them, like a, like a software project uh, and planning it, you know, is something that we can bring these ideas to bear and, and then also on top of that, how kind of new things happen, how we can really learn quite deep things by certain patterns of change that are related to these same ideas about making decisions while, while learning. So starting off with uh, this, this the, 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 at the beginning, um, what is this idea of, of making decisions while learning? How can that be a kind of a scientific uh, uh, concept? So, um, if we um, if we do have an important decision, uh, sometimes we need to weigh out the pros and cons of the different options. So this is like a kind of, you know, in, in the business speak, you know, there's a benefit cost analysis and things like this. And so the kind of science of how to make these bigger decisions um, is it works well when you think about certain decisions that are kind of like a kind of landmark choice where you know there's a big before and after. So like say I want to, 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 to live somewhere else, um, which is topical for me because I do, I do want to, I am thinking of moving at the moment. Um, I might create a spreadsheet. In fact, I have created a spreadsheet and I've listed the, the different places that I might think about moving to. And partly because this is a collaborative process, I'm trying to score you know, different factors that give us kind of places that me and my partner are thinking of moving to. And so we can kind of, collate with that kind of reading we're doing about different places and we can we can consider different options so um 
you know, some of those things that we're considering are the house prices, the obvious one, um, the green spaces, whether there are cafes nearby, sort of shops that are there, transport links that are interesting places, and obviously the commute time, um, which some people remember commuting. It's quite quite a thing that used to happen a while ago. Um, so um, this is the way that when you're making a big decision, you typically will kind of break it into dimensions and then potentially, you know, score those things. And then you can come up with some kind of formula to kind of weight the different things according to which are the most important to you, which might be quite subjective. Um, so this is all, all very straightforward. Another way to make the same kind of decision, of course, which I'm also doing, is visiting each place or asking people about it who've, who've actually uh, lived there or know it very well. Um, and all of these things are going to allow me to make a better decision about where I uh, uh, might want to live. Um, the problem with this is that it might be the case that I don't really know uh, where I want to live until I've actually lived in some of these places. So the the analogy is 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 with you know some food that you haven't you don't know the the the, the, the flavor of the food. So I don't know. Um, if I want a pecan ice cream because I've never tasted pecan, I don't know what pecan tastes like. And it's similar to, to, to living somewhere. It's very hard to do research on the internet and be really sure that you do actually want to live in wherever it is. Um, because living there is a very experiential thing and it can't be summarized. So this is the type of decision problem where you can't find out what the best option is until you've tried at least one of those options. And then only then do you have a clearer idea about whether what, what sometimes not even that option, but just what you care about and what you don't care about. And um, a great example is, is you might just decide to buy a house and then find out once you move in that the neighbors um, keep you up all night and can be heard through a paper thin wall. And you would you just wouldn't know how much you care about that or if that's an issue or even be able to to kind of factor that in until until you've moved in. So so this is the kind of problem decisions that we're, we're dealing with. And economists have a name for this type of um, kind of goods, if you will, if you're buying something, um, and they call them experience goods. And they, they contrast experience goods with search goods. And so this idea has been around for a while and is used by people in marketing as well as economists to understand how to price you know, uh, products because uh, they realize that for an experience good, the buyer can't determine the actual value or cost without actually purchasing the good. And it increases the chance that they don't make the best choice the first time, which is what economists call the, the problem of adverse selection. So uh, this is in contrast to search goods where kind of like the, the internet search that I was doing before for where I want to live, this is where you can obtain all the information you need by simply doing some research. And then when you purchase, you're pretty, you're pretty sure that you're making the best choice. And that's the most common sort of good. Because even things like clothes, you, could, you used to be able to go to a clothes shop and try them on. So then they're, they're, they're a search good because you can try before you, you, uh, you make the actual purchase. Now, of course, clothes are a bit more like an experience good because people are buying so many of them online and they can't even try them on. So this is actually a continuum. No one's saying that this is a concrete, uh, hard continuum nowadays that hard kind of cut off that it is actually a continuum between these um, but what are examples of experienced goods so great examples of books holidays films um, and then of course living somewhere new an interesting thing about books and films and things like that is that you can if someone tries to tell you why a film is good they either fail, you know, they either fail to, 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 to help you to understand why they just tell you they like it or they give away the, the ending of the film because, because it's literally the information that makes the film interesting is the only way they can try and explain to you. And of course, that's the, the spoiler. So, so it's, a, it's a great example of that. Um, where I've taken this research is that I'm saying that any decision when you're actually still learning what information matters and what doesn't is actually like an, uh, buying an experience good. And so now we're getting onto this idea of, of, um, of what decision-making uh, while learning is really, really is. So, so now I've talked about you know, what makes decisions 
while learning what where that how that happens and what it is in a, in a scientific way and by scientific i mean i guess economics um now i'm going to actually show you how to factor that in to you know learning about the situation uh and how you factor that into your decision making and what what that actually looks like so what can you do to uh make better decisions while learning um First, you need to decide whether you're dealing with an experience good type of choice or a search good type of choice. And as I've said, partly it depends on whether you're actually learning yourself. So if you're in a whole new area, then everything is like an experience good. And so it's partly a subjective uh, uh, kind of um, a choice as to whether it's an experience good. So if it is an experience good or more like an experience good, then you need to make a decision in a way that allows you to both experience an option and change your choice. Just like you know, you're trying on clothes in a clothes shop. Uh, and this is what we, we, we're calling agility. This is what I think agility really is. I think it's, it's just um, essentially, agility is reducing the opportunity cost of trying something. So you, take a, you do your first choice, you try it. It doesn't work out perhaps, but the cost of switching to your second choice is actually low. Just like trying on several clothes in a shop is pretty, it's not too too onerous you know you can you can cope with trying several things on so agility can be thought of as reducing the opportunity cost of learning which is the cost to you of experiencing one or more choices before making your final choice and remember that's different to searching and doing research because that sort of learning is it doesn't you don't you're not you're not experiencing stuff you, you can do all your research before you make your choice this is this is doing research by making a choice so an example of this in the IT world is where um, a while ago now we were, look, were looking at um, graph databases and uh, one of our choices we had to make if we were interested in graph databases was whether we wanted the Amazon Web Service Neptune uh, trial or uh, a Neo4j uh, trial and you could look at different uh, factors and you could do your research and you could figure out how much the subscription cost was going to be, uh, how easy it was going to be to learn the language and, and install it. And um, you could look at the maintenance costs and how easy it was to integrate with our systems. You can look at all these different factors. And this is treating it as a search good. But actually, we didn't know anything about graph databases. We didn't have any prior graph databases. We didn't even know what the use cases for these things really were. We were just interested in, in some new technology. So a way that we need so how can we factor that problem of actually which is the easiest one to try which is the best one to kind of sample the whole area of graph databases and so what you can do is you can take one of your choices that you're going to propose and in this case i've chosen aws neptune uh, database with sparkle which is one of the languages you can use with it a uh, small amount of test data and two staff kind of like trialing it and then you can look at some of the other options that you haven't chosen, but you might end up choosing after that because that's not the first option is the one you might not, not go with. So you might find, to really find out whether or not we want it, we'd have to scale it and look at some, some big data to see if it can cope with terabytes of data. Or we might decide we don't like Sparkle, we actually wanna switch it to Gremlin, which is the other language it, it supports. Um, or we just might decide graph databases is not for us. We tried to find some use cases. We tried using them. It, it didn't really work out. Or finally, we could find out that actually a Neo4j database is, is probably a better bet. And so you can, in various ways, uh, kind of calculate the opportunity cost of changing your, your first choice to one of these second choices or multiple ones of those. And you can get an average opportunity cost, which is what's at the bottom there. And that's just how much it costs you to change your choice uh, from one from the first one to, to one of the other ones. And then what you get is this extra dimension in your original kind of table. And if you've done this for the other options, like the Neo4j choice, you might find that there's a big difference between the opportunity cost of one choice versus the other. So what this might mean is that if you think that this is really, you really know your onions, you know, you know about graph databases, you know you want graph database, you know why you want it, 
then you don't care about the opportunity cost of learning and you just choose the best option. And let's say that AWS Neptune is the best option by those criteria. In that case, that's what you do. But if you decide that the opportunity cost of learning is actually something that's likely to, 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 to be needed because this is more like an experience, good, where you're gonna to have to try it to find out, then you factor in this opportunity cost of the different choices. And so you might end up choosing a different choice from your first choice, which might be that the, the Neo 4J might be your first choice because that's the cheapest one to change from. Now let's say you choose Neo 4J and then you end up switching to the AWS Neptune. You might think, well, this is all a waste of time. I should have just chosen the Neptune from the beginning, but you shouldn't kick yourself because that's just one of the things that could have happened, right? But you still would have made a rational choice by going with this one first, because assuming that you, you were actually learning and then you ended up with this one. So this, is, this, this all makes sense. Um, finally, if both choices um, have a very, if this, if this opportunity cost is very high for, for both of these choices, then you, sh you probably should be very careful before doing either of them, right? Because it, you should turn it back into a search good and you should make lots of, do, try and do more research before you jump in because doing this, this, this analysis of how much it costs you to switch your choice might tell you that it's very expensive to switch choices, in which case, um, make the right choice first. So this, all this analysis comes out of analyzing the opportunity cost and any, any one of those answers might be correct. So, so now um, I've shown you how to factor in to an individual choice, you know, what learning about the situation uh, actually means and learn and, and, and making um, and creating, you know, experiences that you can afford. Um, so now I'm going to, in the last part of the talk, just talk about how you can do this for more complex decisions like planning a software project and talk about how uh, you can also make new things happen by certain patterns of, of change that are related to the same, the same ideas. I don't know if anybody has any questions at this point, but um, this might be where more questions come up if not. So um, uh, yeah, just, just give me a shout if you do. Um, so for a software project, there are lots and lots of decisions being made rather than just one. And um, as those decisions are being made, uh, we're building something. And because we're building something, uh, we actually get more experience of the decisions that we've already made. So for example, when something starts off on the drawing board, we discuss all the different options, we do different designs, then we start building some of it. We might have some test data, some trial data, then we eventually move on to bigger data sets. Um, and as we scale up and build more of the software, we get more experience of our, of our previous choices. As we do that, um, the chances of us detecting opportunities to improve the software or change our original choices, that actually increases because more people are looking at the software. Um, the software is, 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 is being made real, so it's easier to understand the choices we've already made. Um, but the downside is that because it's, it's later in the day in terms of the project, the cost of actually acting on these new opportunities is also going up. And so some of these are going to be lost opportunities because eventually it's going to be too expensive. By the time we know that we should have done this or that and would have been a better option, it can be too expensive to change things. It might drop to the bottom of a very long queue of enhancements that we might, uh, might aim to make. So this is probably quite a familiar situation to, to a lot of you working in, in software. Um, we can turn all this into, into another table. I, I apologize for, for yet another table, but um, the way this table works is that at the top, you've got the final stage of the software. So on the top left, you've got the action steps. And the last step in this, in this particular list is the release of the software uh, into production uh, usage by a high number of users uh, for over two years. And so that's where we're gonna see uh, the most opportunities detected. But if you read across to the right, you'll see that I've, I've, I've given each opportunity an opportunity cost of 10 grand, because at that point, making any changes two years after you release the software, 
you've lost an opportunity that's quite expensive potentially. Um, if you work your way down the rows in the table, you just get to earlier stages of this kind of software project. And as you go down, the software is, is less complete, which is the second column. The length of time that it's in use is smaller. Um, the number of users is less and the number of departments who've, in this case, we're imagining different departments of users, that's, that often is getting smaller. Um, so these columns all together define the amount of experience of the software, which turns into a rate of, of opportunity detection. And this column just summarizes uh, for each row, um, the actual overall kind of opportunity detection that we're, 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 we're estimating from those, those source numbers. And then finally, this column is the trade-off. It's telling you the cost of the opportunity when it's detected at that stage versus an earlier stage. And so it starts off uh, at the, the top row is the most expensive opportunity cost because it's the most final uh, stage of the, of the kind of software. Uh, life cycle and and then at the bottom you've got the initial very early days when it's very cheap to take opportunities. So okay so so far so good but I want to draw your attention to uh, this row which is an example that I um, saw discussed um, at an agile workshop where someone suggested that if you were building a website that you might want to create before you actually build anything create a cardboard dashboard and then go to a shopping mall where your customers might might be or in this case a, a user workshop and you might want to get them to play with your cardboard dashboard and then that might actually be um, a good way to actually detect you know different opportunities to improve the software and what's nice about it of course is that it's cheap and if, if it is a good idea, the reason it will be a good idea is because of the rate of opportunity detection. So I've given it you know, a 60% rating and the opportunity cost is only 50 pounds. So that's a pretty good performing kind of stage. So um, in economics terms, this would be called a substitute experience because it's a substitute for a more expensive later stage where the opportunity cost is higher. Um, and so it gives you some of the benefits of a later stage with the low cost of the earlier stage. So now when we're planning uh, software projects, we can think uh, not necessarily in terms of feedback, which is the most common kind of language, but in terms of substitute experiences. So any experience that's similar in effect to a more expensive experience, but cheaper is, is a substitute good. And this is really important when we think about experience goods because substitute experiences can, can allow us to make better decisions. Um, you know, some examples of, of um, substitute experiences are stabilizers when you're learning to ride a bike, um, visiting the place you want to live and staying there for several days, or I guess renting somewhere, um, trying a small amount of pecan ice cream or this cardboard interface um idea so in terms of your you know anything you can imagine that works as a good substitute experience is potentially a good substitute experience it's, it's just a way of thinking about what you're trying to achieve and the economic trade-off between the, the 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 detection of opportunities and the cost of those opportunities because obviously a cardboard interface isn't perfect and that's what's interesting is how would you get that fidelity to get to be higher um so as I said, that's 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 the low cost and high fidelity kind of trade off that you're trying to 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 play with. So I've talked about substitute tasks where one task is a substitute for another one, or an experience is a substitute for another one. But some experiences are actually substitutes for multiple other experiences. So an example is a, is a film or a book or a play. Um, these are not really substitute experiences for one experience. They're a substitute for many, many different experiences. And, and that's probably why they're considered very rich in terms of, in terms of entertainment. Um, we learn a lot by experiencing something because um, of the kind of density of different experiences that, 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 that are part of, of that thing. Um, and this is where it gets interesting because while a film, book or a play sounds very entertaining, reviewing code does not sound very entertaining, but 
I think I can show that reviewing code is one of these substitute experiences that substitutes for multiple, many, many tasks. And the reason is that it contains, it overlaps with many specific concrete tasks to improve that code. So either the code could, could have bugs in it or the programmer could have a diminished understanding of, of the code that could be improved or there are opportunities for like quality of life or to improve the speed of the code or to identify areas where there's opportunity to, to, to add new uh, requirements. All of those, those different many, many tasks that you might not know or specifically have in your, in your head when you start could come up from reviewing, just reviewing the code without any particular thing in mind. So this is an example of a fractal uh, substitute task and it's very rich. So it contains many opportunities to improve uh, the code. So it's, so it's a very important, I think, um, type of task. Uh, there's another way we can think about um, substitute tasks and this kind of fractal tasks. And that's in terms of skepticism about our own knowledge. So if you think about um, the way we normally have a flow of a process or a flow of tasks, um, we normally are trying to standardize and make more efficient um, the tasks that are being performed. So this, this little kind of cartoon is of like one task being performed, which hands over to a second and third task, which both run in parallel, but separately. And this would be like a portion of any kind of process. It could be developing software or it could be um, a business process. Now, this second diagram looks, looks you know, very messy in comparison, but it basically expresses the idea that these different tasks are checking each other. So the people doing those tasks are checking, actually did task one get handed over the way it should have done if I'm doing task two? Or task one, does task three actually need what I'm doing? Maybe I should just abandon task one and not even bother because task three doesn't need it anymore. And then task two is running parallel to task three, but it's gonna check, even though it's meant to be an independent task, gonna check that task three is actually happening too. And then there's this whole new task 2A, which actually is there just to check task two. So all of this checking might seem very wasteful from an efficiency point of view, but if you're interested in how to learn, um, it's important that you question your own assumptions. And this is expressing skepticism about your knowledge. So that's, that's how I would describe it. It's not redundancy as such, it's skepticism. And so uh, this quote from Socrates is relevant because um, he, he, he realized he, Socrates was told he was the wisest person in, in, in Athens. And um, he said, well, if I am, then um, I'm probably just a bit wiser because um, what I don't know, I don't think I know. And, th and that's a, a very powerful idea in, in software where you're being kind of, you're, you're, you're learning as you're going, it implies that, that you need to question your assumptions. And you can encode that into your tasks by making them more fractal, by making each task have uh, different parts or substitutes for other tasks going on in them as well. Because that way, there are more opportunities to pick up something you didn't, you didn't know, but you had assumed. Um, and you can measure that too. So you can measure the fractal similarity of task two, which is what I'm doing here, to the other tasks in the group. And you can see that, 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 that by measurement of the containership of one task by another, because it's part of task two is to check task one and also to look at task three. Um, this way you can measure in a plan how, um, how much skepticism there is in your, in your uh, tasks. And this would have been really useful for me if I'd have actually uh, identified it a bit earlier because of a case where I handed over some reports which were finished by somebody else in my team and I assumed they were being used uh, because I sent the email to everybody uh, saying that they were available and I thought they were needed uh, urgently and then found out a few weeks later that there was a mix-up and they were using the UAT reports which they also thought were incomplete so weren't really using them and so like, a few weeks of work was potential work was lost because of that assumption of a handover, which which seemed kind of obvious to me that I, you know that that was a handed over, you know, but it, in fact it wasn't. 
So but by, by being more skeptical about my knowledge with this parallel task that I assumed was going on but wasn't, I could have uh, picked that up. And um, this becomes more important the more valuable it is to be skeptical about your own knowledge. So the, the more that you think you, you might need to learn, even though it comes at a cost. So the final part of the talk, I want to, to, to talk about something a bit more, uh, I guess a bit deeper, I suppose. Um, and that is that, that, that you're also learning while doing. And sometimes you're learning even though you don't realize it. And sometimes new things can happen even though um, you just seem to be doing something quite routine. And there's, and there's a maths to this too. There's a, there's a kind of a science of this. And so an example of this uh, is um, that in the, in the early 20th century, um, photos of fast moving things were different in content to photos that were slowly composed. Um, because they required different film, different setup, and they typically featured different locations and different subject matter. Um, the photographer Cartier-Bresson, um, in the early 20th century, he, he, he was taking you know, slowly composed static photos with some equipment, and at other times he was taking uh, fast action photos with the kind of faster film and, and, and lighter cameras and so on. Um, but gradually he started changing how he did these things um, only to save himself time. So reducing the opportunity cost of one setup and then switching to another setup. So he started by using the same camera. I mean, this is an example I've made up by the way, but I, I just noticed this photo. So just imagine that he started using uh, the same camera and set up for both action shots and uh, still shots. Um, then he starts using the same film for both action shots and still shots. And so he's just reducing the cost of him having to switch from one thing, uh, one task to another. Um, then he can move from one type of shot uh, to another in the same day. Uh, so sometimes he's doing static shots and then he's doing action shots in the same day because he's got the same film, same camera. Uh, then he picks places where maybe the content allows a mixture uh, chances at least for both types of shot. And then one day he takes this photo here on the right, which I saw in the Pompidou Center uh, in, in Paris. And it's a change, you know, uh, you imagine him kind of switching in mid composition from this kind of carefully framed static shot to um, an action shot of this guy kind of leaping across the, 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 the puddle there. And so what you've got is, is, is a novel kind of photograph in the in the in the uh, 30s or 40s when he when he took it, and so what's interesting to me is that uh, when you reduce the opportunity cost between two or more tasks, then the chances are that you can create some entirely new experience. Something new becomes more likely. Um, it's actually a form of of information compression that's happening, and Cartier Bresson has captured that what can actually be a cognitive process as well uh, in film. And it, it really reminds me of poetry because poetry obviously packs a lot of information and multiple things into the same uh, words and, and phrases. And um, there's a quote um, that's uh, used in the film, The Big Short, which, is, um, which I liked, which is um, the truth um, is like poetry um, and everybody fucking hates poetry. And I think it's an interesting uh, quote uh, because it, 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 there, there is a truth to it. And um, so um, on, that, on that note, I'm just gonna summarize. Uh, so when, when making decisions, uh, you can work out if this is more like buying an experience good or a search good. Uh, if you're learning from the experience, it's partly an experience good. So you need to factor in the choice, uh, you factor in the cost of changing your choice and you need to give that factor enough weight, um, you know, the weight that it actually deserves. So um, you also can figure out the best value experience from your project or your team uh, as you build and not all experiences are of equal value. So substitute experiences can be like the real thing, but cheaper um, and they can combine lots of different experiences uh, the way a movie does, and reviewing code is actually one of those examples. Um, 
Finally, the opportunity to learn only happens when you're skeptical. So building skepticism into tasks uh, to make them more fractal um, is, is, a, is a good idea if you know that you're likely to need to learn. Um, and then finally, profoundly new experiences can happen. And I believe that this can be science too. Uh, and when captured visually, we, we call it art. And uh, I just wanna say thanks to, to James Robert White uh, for the artwork uh, and, the, and the chats, and um, also for the, the chats with Andrea Fantuzzi, Stefan Jala, and uh, Matt's uh, support as well from PPL. And, um, and there are some reference ideas that are related to this, which I'll be, be delighted to discuss, uh, but there, is other, there are other theories out there. Uh, Knightian uncertainty is, is an interesting concept, a Godic theory, uh, and so on. These, these, these two are all, are all interesting, which I haven't mentioned directly. And uh, yeah, that's, that's, the, uh, that's the talk. So that's all from me. I don't know how I'm doing for time. I think it's, yeah, I think it's about right. Um, so yeah, so I don't know if anybody has any, any questions uh, or would like to just discuss things or just give a reaction. Um, I can carry on recording or if there are no, no one really wants to talk, I can just stop the recording and then we can chat. So it's, uh, it's really up to you guys. Um, or we can all uh, get some time back and, and call it quits. I want to ask about the art, Adam. You said you'd, uh, you'd tell us the relevance of the art. Yeah, the, so the artwork is, is um, by uh, James Robert White. Um, I've known James for a long time, and he's, uh, he's also um, uh, somebody who's interested in science. So um, he's actually interested in complexity science, which is something that I've looked at for a long time and which is kind of related to this kind of stuff. So the artwork itself um, is a product of his kind of uh, techniques that he's discovered um, for um, uh, creating kind of a, a physical kind of situation. So he doesn't simply draw or paint them. They kind of evolve uh, using his kind of parameters and, um, and they examples of, of fractal kind of shapes and self-similarity in there. So I think I can... can um, uh, bring up the slides again and you'll you'll see that that um there is this kind of um there is this kind of fractality uh to the to the slides this is a close-up for example and um these kind of triangular patterns um are kind of a common theme of the way i guess raindrops dropping down the a screen can kind of follow those kind of trajectories but if you imagine millions of them, because it's kind of dust um, that's uh, accumulating. I don't know which is the best example here. This is a close up, you can kind of see. And um, yeah, I don't know if James is on this call. He might be, he might be willing to talk about it or he might not. No, he might not be on the call, I didn't see. But um, it's, uh, yeah, I yeah, I really like it. Uh, hang on, can you hear? Yep. No, oh, you can. Great. Yes, uh, I am on the call. Um, very interesting, Adam. A couple of things that uh, I'd like to address first is it's very similar when you're actually trying to do live drawing, uh, looking at various things, measuring the uh, uh, angles of various things and how you learn when you start to draw and how you re-address uh, lines. But we'll pick that up offline. In terms of the art, it's something that uh, I've been looking into for, for many years, as Adam has said. Um, th there's there's plenty of uh, um, other things I can do, but m might be best if we uh, speak offline in case we're boring everybody else. Uh, I'll give you some other um, uh, resources uh, in terms of that. But yes, it, it comes out of observation. It comes out of always looking at various linear patterns and how to uh, understand and create those linear patterns as they um, carve their way through life uh, so to speak um, but uh, yeah if you'd like to know any more please do uh, hit Adam up and uh, I'll send you over some other resources if you'd like thanks James yeah so I don't know if anybody else has any questions any more questions and it's Mark here 
it was a few years ago, but I read John Coates's The Hour Between Dog and Wolf, where he looks at decision making in financial markets and risk taking. And he, su he suggests that actually decision making is largely not that at all. It's actually post decision justification and that decision making is really driven by our body chemistry and our craving for dopamine and cortisol and testosterone and all the rest of it. What, what, what do you make of such a thing? How does how does that what 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 are, what's the latest view? Because that book's been around a while now. What's the latest view on things of that of that nature? Yeah. So there's I mean there's been a lot of work in so this example of this example of um, you know search goods and experience goods has been around since the seventies and it's part of a thing called the SEC kind of group because the other one is called credence goods actually, which are goods that even after you purchase them, you don't know if they're any good or not. So examples are like health insurance or, or things like that. Um, so that's an example of what's called information asymmetries, which is just the idea that you don't, you, you're going to make bad decisions. And um, information asymmetries are a big part of economics now. Um, it's not necessarily everyone agrees that, 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 that that's the way economics should, should go, but certainly because of, what's called behavioral economics, where people are analyzing kind of heuristics that people use to make decisions and biases, which we're all familiar with now from the kind of cognitive bias kind of training that we're doing. That's all being kind of incorporated into economics too. Um, the only question really is whether you need to go into the detail of human psychology and assume that people are making decisions because of kind of evolutionary reasons like dopamine and stuff like that, because there are other, there are other theories. If I skip to the end, there are other theories that, that, um, that, um, like a, a Godic theory, for example, is the theory that if you just take into account the fact that people are making decisions on a timeline and don't just average them, over all possibilities kind of outside of time, which is what economists do, then the fact that they get some information at first and then more information later, and they have to do something with that information is forcing them to make decisions that then look a bit like biases, like reasoning biases that, that are more complex explanations. So the more complex explanation about dopamine and stuff can actually be unnecessary. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's, it's our, and, and, and that implies that people are more rational than we're assuming. It's just that they don't follow a kind of statistical averaging used by economists. They're using a more complex statistical pattern. So the jury is out on whether we're bad decision makers or good decision makers, I would say. Um, but we're more complex decision makers. That's for sure, for sure. Um, I don't know if anyone else has got, got any, any more uh any more questions or would like to pick up on anything um, just just curious adam in terms of um you know you talk about the opportunity cost and that sounds it sounds really good in theory but how would you actually go about sort of calculating that in a reliable reliable way yeah so this is the big problem with with social sciences and economics is it, you can you can obviously come up with a nice neat theory as to you know this is this is how decisions are made um, and then what you typically find in economics is that we talk about things like utils and satisfaction as in how much utility does this have for me but it's incredibly hard to put a number on the utility of a decision I mean for example uh, you know I, we might end up deciding that we don't want a graph database at all so what's the utility of that decision um, how would you factor that in as one option which is to do nothing um, against options to, you know, invest in graph databases. It's very difficult to, to define that. So you've, you've definitely always got this problem in economics of how to give these things precise numbers. Um, but in, it, it, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't, in my view, have a, a, um, a model of how to make a good decision because intuitively this can help you. If the model is quite good, it can help the shape the conversations that you're having. And some of these conversations can be improved over things like just talking about feedback. Because if you talk about opportunity cost of a decision, it's a more sophisticated, in my view, sophisticated model of what's going on 
than just saying we need we need to get some feedback or we'll just try this. So it can mean just a slightly more informed conversation. Whether whether these whether you would live and die by these numbers in this table, I doubt. I doubt that you would do that. But whether you could be more informed as to what you're doing, uh, I think you can be much more informed. Yeah. That's a bit more structure. I guess you're bringing some structure and some logic to kind of the decision making yeah. to go to go ahead with something or not, rather than just going yeah. on gut gut feel or, or previous experience. Yeah. yeah. And and the model can help you to identify things like, you know, what you're trying to achieve when you're shaping a plan. Because when you have so many options about what to do, there's so many dimensions, it can help to narrow down what dimensions you're interested in. So talking about things like a substitute experience can help you to focus and develop your ideas because you're selecting from a very large group of options, right? So you need something to help you, a theme or something to help you to shape what you're actually planning. Um, because it's never a binary choice, you know, really, or, you know, uh, there's always a huge number of options. That's, that's kind of the problem. So, so it helps to have these kind of ideas, I think, or concepts floating around in your head uh, to help you narrow down some of the options. Uh, I think this is really interesting, particularly in the, um, you know, obviously in the technology domain, and, and you've been talking about the software um, analogy, but uh, I think, you know, the other bit that jumps out at me is the, the, the growth of, of cloud and the fact that, you know, all these options are, you know, whenever we're making at PPL architectural decisions, we've often got lots of options available to us. Um, and so we've got much greater choice than we've ever had in the past in terms of, of approaches we can take or directions we can go down or, or particular services or tools we can select. Um, and I think the opportunity cost of, of trialing those has never been lower either because they're all on these interesting commercial models now where you pay as you go or whatever, you know, spin up an instance, it's ready, ready immediately, et cetera. And actually this kind of thinking is, is really beneficial to that versus the more traditional, um, you know, uh, um, gather a small number of options like big pros and cons type analysis, your, your search, um, search good as you, as you called it at the beginning yeah the, the experience good definitely is um i think uh, it's important it's important to realize that marketeers the people selling us these products are using these ideas so the search um experience credence model is being used by marketeers to tempt people to make decisions because they know that if they're selling an experience good that they need to offer a very low bar for people to trial something but then they also know that reputation also counts for more if it's an experience good. So people are, you know, more focused on reputation because they can't, they can't reliably judge the quality before they buy. Um, and if you think about the way IT works, we try to, we can, we can often make it easy to try things, but then it comes surprisingly hard to switch after a certain point. And of course, that's how you get hooked. And, and, and the marketeers are fully aware of this. So I think as consumers, we should definitely be more aware and think in the same way so that we're, we're kind of, a little bit of a it's a bit of an arms race you know and if you're not in the if you're not you're not aware of what they're doing it's it can be quite hard to to navigate through it um it does tie into a whole literature on that which you can look at online um in terms of how markets behave how consumers behave uh based on what kind of good they're 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 purchasing um, but yeah um, I mean, I was aiming the talk to be practical in terms of everyday stuff, but I think that people have very different reactions to that. Some people go, oh, that's quite interesting. And other people will be horrified at the idea of analyzing choices like this <laughs> and kind of breaking it down. I'm, I mean, obviously, of the, I find it interesting, but I mean, I appreciate that, that not everybody likes intuitively trying to think in these terms. So I, I, you know, I, I'm interested to see how people react to these kinds of kind of economic ideas in their own thinking um anyway i, I think you make a really good point matt and i think about what perhaps stops us sometimes from trying the experience and re recognizing that the opportunity cost is low and taking the risk but i think i think what gets in the way sometimes is time and i, and I just in terms of we've got deadlines to launch something or make things available and that stops us trying stuff because we feel like we have to make a decision that we stick with and I wonder how you 
I wonder how you factor time into that calculation, Adam, of opportunity cost. Yeah, I mean, this is what, well, this is what economists are obviously well practiced at kind of modeling, you know, um, there are solutions to these kinds of, of dilemmas. Um, and you can, certainly can factor in time into this kind of decision making, but it does get more complicated. And, and as I hinted at with the ergodic theory, when you factor in time properly, it gets much more complex to figure out whether someone's, for example, being rational or not being rational. Um, but um, a fundamental thing is, the is that kind of switching cost from one option to another, because, um, because you, you and, and the other option is, the other question is, you might say that time is the most valuable thing, but um, if you are clear that you actually need to experience different options, that's, that's where the whole equation changes. You know, to research things properly um, can save you loads of time and saves you the cost of switching later. But, um, but like you said, Mark, is sometimes it's post decision justification rather than really we should have taken a better option um so uh, well, yeah it's possibly, possibly part of the answer is trials try stuff out before you know you need it you know, take the time pressure away you buy yourself that window that's, to that's what i mean yeah. trial, throw them away if, yep. if you wait until you know you need something that's what creates the time pressure so perhaps yeah. it's a justification for a bit more r d budget and a bit more just experimenting time I think it is. I think it is. And I think that's a really interesting option because that's, of course, where the, the time, you know, is, 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 is quite subjective. Because if you set aside some resources over the course of a couple of years just to try different things, then suddenly the equation looks completely different to when yeah. you suddenly realize it. Well, if there are no more uh, questions or discussion or people don't want to make a make a point or anything, then maybe I'll, I'll wrap up. Um, thanks so much, everybody, for uh, joining me on this call. Um, I hope you did find it. I hope you did all find something of interest there. Um, I really appreciate the discussion as well and uh, the conversations. And um, maybe we can uh, you know, continue uh, talking about some of these things. Um, and I'll attempt to, uh, oh, that's it, stop the recording. And, uh...